Welcome back to another episode of the Girls Talk Money podcast. We have a super exciting episode for you guys today with an absolutely incredible guest. This might be by far our most requested episode topic. Today, we are diving into all things investing, and to do so, we are bringing in Jeremy Schneider from Personal Finance Club. If you don't follow Personal Finance Club on Instagram, on Instagram, you are seriously missing out. Jeremy has over 500,000 Instagram followers and posts so much educational value-packed content. If you search basically anything about investing on Google and go over to the images, one of the Personal Finance Club Instagram posts are like guaranteed to pop up, which I think is so cool. Grace and I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Jeremy in person twice this year at the Economy Conference and at FinCon in the fall. He is so inspiring. He's built like six companies. He sold his first one for millions of dollars. But throughout his 20s and 30s, while building a company, he lived off of a $36,000 salary a year and was able to save and invest a lot of that from living below his means. In this episode, we're going to cover how to start investing, why you should be answering the question of if you need a financial advisor in your 20s, and so much more. But before we get into the episode, we're going to do our weekly recap. So Grace, hello. What is going on in your week? Hello. I'm super excited for this episode. But yes, this week has been. I feel like there's been a lot of stuff going on this past week. So I finally found an apartment and I actually went to go sign the lease before this, before we started filming. Um, and then I opened the lease and it was 67 pages. So <laughs> we're going to have a little afternoon reading. We're going to have. Yeah, because it's going to be, it's going to be a lot to read. Um, but I'm the type of girl that like, if I'm getting a contract, I'm going to read every single line of that contract. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to play. So, um, I'm going to read that. But, uh, once I sign out later today, I will be moving this Saturday. It is a Wednesday when we're filming this. So only a few days away, which stressed me out a little bit to be signing my lease only a couple days before I move. But you know what? Sometimes the cookie crumbles in ways you don't want it to when you just have a whole bunch of So it's fine. I'm so ready to have my own space. I am so excited. And kind of like going along with this in the past week, I've had a couple little, I want to say like revelations. Cause I feel like that makes it sound like I was like, you know, like a come to Jesus moment or something here. But <laughs> I kind of had a few like realizations about my health. I finished a book this week. I was listening to this audio book called Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety. And it's all about foods that are really high in certain nutrients that are really good for your brain and neuroplasticity and anxiety and stuff. And I realized from reading that book that I'm terrible at taking care of myself and nourishing my body. Terrible. Okay. Like they were talking about eating like all these diverse vegetables and things. And I was like, I eat mostly green vegetables and probably only a handful of times a week. Like I just get so lazy with making food and I'm so excited to be in my own apartment and be able to just cook whatever I want and just like try new things. And like, I don't know, really have fun with that. And I also went out this weekend and I went to Boston and I drank and your girl was, she was a little drunk. And then the next day it was one of those moments where I was like, I never want to drink ever again. You know, um, I feel like if you consume alcohol, you've probably had one of those days where you're just like, no, I never want to drink ever again in my entire life. And, you know, it just made me realize that I want to be a sober sister for a little while. I do. <laughs> so that's going to be my journey for at least the next month. I think I just, I don't know. I was like, what is it bringing into my life? You know, it's it, you loosen up a little bit. You go have a fun night, whatever, but it's really not that great for my health. It is not great for anxiety. I'm like, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll just take the sober sister route. So that's all kind of lumped into one thing. Cause I'm just so excited to have my own space and establish new routines and habits and really focus on my health and my new space and my new kitchen. So I love I'm that. Excited. A few things on that. Um, I've been loving my juicer lately. Um, you've been yes. talking about like diversifying the fruits and vegetables and things that you're eating on a weekly basis. And I think my juicer helps with this a lot because you juice like a ton of different fr fruits and vegetables all in one. Mm -hmm. And then every time you drink your green juice, you're drinking a ton of fruits and veggies. So you could always look into a juicer. Mine was only like $50. Um, I have That's a bullet one and I love it. Um, so I've been doing that a lot recently. I feel like I love it much more in the winter for some reason, because I'm like craving 
like the nutrients because it's so cold and just like gross outside Mm -hmm. and I'm like craving something refreshing like that um which you would think would be the opposite I would use it a lot more in the summer but I don't know yeah um and then about the alcohol thing I totally relate to that as well I haven't been doing dry January um I did have like one margarita last week when my boyfriend and I went on a date but I've just been having kind of like a like I I sort of decided that if I do dry January and then just resort back to like my prior relationship with alcohol, that doesn't really make any sense. I want to kind of like build my relationship with alcohol into my overall life in 2024. So that's why I was like, I'm not going to commit to just dry January. I'm just going to kind of commit to having a better relationship with alcohol in 2024. And for me, I've decided that was like really no more than one drink per night and no Mm -hmm. more than like a couple of drinks per month. So I don't want to have a drink like a couple times a week, every single week. But I also don't want to have like a couple drinks in one sitting because that's when I feel like crap the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had a margarita last Friday. Maybe I'll have like a glass of wine this weekend if we go out and do something. I, I That's kind of the relationship with alcohol that I want to have. Yeah. I am not the type of person that drinks at home. Like I don't like have a glass of wine before bed or like have a drink with dinner. Like I've never been that way. I just, I mean, I guess I used to be that way. I would have like a glass of wine or something when I was at home, if I was like going to take a bubble bath or something like that. But I just, it doesn't, it, it used to hurt my stomach so bad. So I was like, why am I going to do this anyways? But now I feel like I am also like at a similar point where I'm just like, I want to just be like, again, like a sober sister for a little bit and then kind of just focus on limiting alcohol consumption. So like when I go to dinner, instead of getting like two drinks, just have one. Um, I don't really go out and like party that much at all. Like I hardly go out and like have like a full bender, you know? Um, but like even just limiting that or like when I'm on vacation, not like going crazy every night, like, cause I'm the type of person also where like I can go to a club or a bar and have fun sober. Like I will, I will shake my ass the same way, whether I'm like drunk or so. Like, I'm going to have fun, you know? Yeah, I'm so the same way. I don't really need, like, the alcohol, you know? I don't know. Yeah. I just feel like I, it's not it's not jiving well with my body and my health. So yeah. that's why I'm No, kind of I agree. I The first realization I had with alcohol was that if I'm out at a bar and I'm going to order a vodka soda or a tequila soda, I would rather just have the soda water with <laughs> a lime in it. <laughs> No, like, that's the thing. It tastes terrible. It tastes terrible. Yeah. It makes you feel terrible. And if I'm drinking the soda water, I love the taste of soda water. Like, yeah. I'll just enjoy that, be super hydrated, yeah. and, like, feel good the next day and be right. able to drive myself home after having yeah. only, like, one drink over the course of a couple of hours. Right? Yeah. Give me, give me a little Diet Coke, and I'll be just as happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yes, it'll still feel yeah. like a treat. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. So, anyways, what's going on in your life, Erin? Honestly, there is not that much going on. Um, I was trying to think of it. <laughs> and I don't mean that in like, a, I just like the weather and everything. Like I've just been an inside girly. It is literally it's 10 degrees that. this entire week in Pittsburgh. And I've been going outside just for the sake of Bella. I'm like letting her play a little bit. But other than that, like I haven't been going to, I go to LA Fitness for my gym, which is, it's like literally right across the street, but I still have to get into my car to go to it. I haven't even been going there. I've been going to my apartment gym, which I'm so thankful to have right now. Um, Just because I don't want to scrape my car off. You will not catch me yeah. scraping my car. That's the benefit of working from home is that I don't have to scrape off my car. Mm-hmm. Um, So I've just been staying in my little apartment complex, taking my dog outside when she needs to go outside and living inside. But with that, I feel like I've been spending a lot of time on work and just really thinking through like we've been talking about this a lot on the podcast but just thinking through like what I actually want to accomplish this year mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm a little bit all over the place like I have so many different things that I want to dabble in this year when it comes to my business and like starting new projects and all of the things but I'm really trying to embody the whole like 12 week year thing mm-hmm. which if you don't mm-hmm. know what the 12 week year is it's essentially breaking your annual goals up into like one to two focus areas per quarter. So the first quarter of this year ends at the end of March. And I'm, I've am i been spending a, a little bit of time thinking through, you know, at the end of March, what do I want to have actually done? What are one to two big focus areas that I want to have in my life and in my work? And what do I want to have done by the end of March? So I think for me, Obviously, we're still focusing on the podcast, but I don't think that I can really count that because that was sort of like a Q4 2023 project. Um, So that's in there. But I think for Q1 of this year, my two big focus areas are going to be getting back into YouTube. I'm trying to get back into YouTube. I really want to do that this year. I want it to be a big thing in 2024 and I want to learn. I just want to be good at it. Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of one of those things where I know that I'm not good at it now and it's sort of like a challenge to like 
learn how to be good at it. So challenging myself in that regard. And then um, the events, I'm getting ready to throw um, a Galentine's Day event. I feel like when this episode is coming out, it's going to be very close to the Galentine's Day event. So just working on throwing that, which I think is going to be kind of a big thing in Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, those are two, my two little focus areas for my first 12 week year. I love that. I really need to embody the 12 week year thing more. I think I have like smaller little things rather than having like themes. I have like smaller things for like Q1, but I, we should like bring on somebody who's like done like the 12 week year thing, like over and over again, because I find it really fascinating and really motivating because you're like, I only got 12 weeks to get my ish together and to do what I need to do, you know, as where I'm like, eh, I'll get to that later in 2024, you know, but kind of like yeah. pushing yourself to be like I only got to the end of March to do this thing that like I feel like lights a bit of a fire under your tush you know yeah I think the official way to do it is to like map out what you're going to accomplish every single week so if I wanted mm. to get like started on YouTube this week it would be like finding a YouTube editor and mm. doing whatever like you're kind of giving yourself like little mini tasks per week so I think that's the official way to do it I was just sort of saying like okay by the end of March I'm going to like do x y and z for like yeah. a YouTube channel and things like that um yeah, so that's what's going on in my le my week. Just trying to, you know, keep myself organized. I've been really using Notion a lot recently to like organize everything between my content calendar, my life planner, all of the things, my habits, routines, everything like that. I've just been really loving Notion. Making it aesthetic is like such a hack because then you're so mm -hmm. motivated to go in there and use it. So that's that's I what's going Notion. on in my week. Yes. But I think that wraps up our weekly recap. So we're going to get ready to bring in Jeremy to talk all things investing, financial advisors, and all of that good stuff for today's episode. Welcome, Jeremy. We are so excited to have you on the Girls Talk Money podcast today. We did give everyone a little intro on who you are, but if you could introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do, and your career story in your own words, that would be awesome. Sure. Hi, Real Life Friends. It's so great to see you on your own podcast after seeing each other in actual human life. Um, yeah, my name is Jeremy. I My shtick is that I retired at 36. I'm now 43. And the way I got there was basically instead of taking a job at Microsoft when I graduated from college, I turned that job offer down and started my own company. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was literally Googling how to start company, uh, you know, for, you know, the first few months. And for the first couple of years, I was losing money. I was living on credit cards. My first full year in business, my like, top line revenue is $14,000, um, which even back then wasn't enough to even cover the most, most basic groceries because I had to like pay for my business expenses too. Um, but after a few years, I started figuring it out. I started hiring employees. I always... Uh, was the lowest paid employee at my company because I wanted to use the revenue to fuel growth, not to fuel my own personal bank account. And then at the age of 34, I sold my company for just over $5 million, which was really nice. My share after taxes was about $2 million, which I then basically dumped into some index funds. And uh, two years later, I quit my job at 36 and I haven't really had a full-time job, although that's kind of slowly becoming less true these days. Um, and now, yeah, that $2 million is just basically through investing has grown to about $5 million today. Um, and that's, that's what I do now. Now I teach people about personal finance and investing on the internet. Can you talk about how Personal Finance Club got started? Is that right when you sold your first company or did that start a little bit later or how did that come about? Well, I, when I was growing my company, I always saw that, you know, selling it would be this like big win, this like finish line, I like success. I did the thing, I got millions. Now you like move to an island and drink, you know, Mai Tais all day or whatever. Um, and so for a year year after I quit my job, that's kind of what I did. I I moved to Italy for two months and coached beach volleyball. I like went to, to Australia for almost two months. I started playing, I'm not a gamer. I've never really played video games, but I just, just bored. I like downloaded a video game and started like gaming all day. And I was like, all right, this is what you do. You just, you're on vacation full time. Right. And it was, you know, it was definitely fun for a while, but after a while I also got really, uh, I don't know if boring is the right word, but certainly like unfulfilling. And I didn't really want to meet people when I was 70 and like be talking about my life. And they're like, so what's your story? I was like, well, I sold a company when I was 34 and I've been a piece of shit ever since. Um, that didn't really seem like a great way to live, live life. And so 
I, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend back then and she was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I would love to like teach personal finance. It's just what I like helping my friends with the name personal finance club actually came from, I would like meet with my friends casually over a beer and we'd set up their Roth IRA and pick some index funds or whatever. And jokingly, they would call it like, oh, we should have personal finance club again. Um, and so, yeah, after a year of being retired, I started an Instagram account and I called it a personal finance club. And basically I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I need some sort of challenge. I'm just going to post every single day for a year and try to hit 50,000 followers. I thought that'd be something that like this massive achievement. Um, and it actually took me like 54 weeks to get to 50,000 followers. Crazy. It was like almost exactly a year, uh, when I got there. And yeah, so that was the, that was the beginning. So you mentioned that when you sold your first company, you dumped your $2 million split or whatever into index funds is that's not when you started investing. Can you talk about how you got started investing when you decided to start investing and like how you learned about personal finance? Sure. I was very fortunate to have parents who taught me this stuff. And, um, we live in a weird world where if you don't have parents who teach it to you, you're kind of on your own, you know, yeah. It's easy to blame schools for everything, but like we don't really learn in schools. Like teachers generally don't know it either, because I am always teaching teachers about this stuff. And so we just live in this world that like not only do the rich get richer, but like the rich children, in addition to having all sorts of, you know, head starts in life, they just have more knowledge too. Um and I wasn't rich. We were like middle class or maybe upper middle class, but my when I was sixteen or seventeen, I got kind of got my first on paper paid job with a W two. And then my dad noticed that I had income and he's like, said, Hey, let's open you a Roth IRA because the rule of the Roth IRA is you can't contribute to it unless you have earned income, which I finally did. And I think I made $1,200 that summer. And so my dad actually gifted me $1,200. He basically matched me, my income one for one. He like, let me keep my $1,200 as a 16 year old to basically you know, cover 16 year old expenses, then put his whole $1,200 into the Roth IRA. Um, which led of the law was following the rules because you can't contribute more than your income, which is what I did, even though technically that money came from a gift. Then what we did, and this is important if you're listening, uh, girls who talk money, is that we, we invested the money, right? So a, a Roth IRA on its own is just an empty account. So we, when it's, once we put that money in, we had to choose the investments. And so we back then, kind of... Am I dating myself? I don't know. I'm one of those old people who says I'm dating myself all of a sudden. But but <laughs> we chose some mutual funds because either my dad, didn't, I mean, index funds existed, but he didn't know about them or whatever. So we choose, chose some mutual funds, um, and which was a great option. And then over the years, I basically just continued learning. And I kind of put the learning into hyperdrive when I um, knew I was going to sell my company. We basically shook hands on the price. And I had three or four months of this due diligence phase where they were basically, you know, running background checks on me and the business and stuff. And so I was like, hmm, I think I'm going to get millions of dollars deposited in my bank account one of these days. I should learn what to do with it. And so I started reading every book on personal finance and investing. And I was like, oh, all these books say the exact same thing. It's not that hard. It's just not talked about in pop culture. So for someone who doesn't have that that guidance, right? It's interesting that you now kind of fill that parental guidance, basically. It's interesting that you kind of now like fill that gap a little bit and you've taught at this point roughly how many people how to invest thousands tens of thousands it depends what you count if you count everyone <laughs> who like follows me on a social media it's definitely in the hundreds of thousands if you count people who like have gone through my course it's 20 or thirty thousand. um if you count people who uh i don't know genuinely like me it's in the dozens so um <laughs> yeah it depends what you count Okay, so somewhere between, uh, you know, well, roughly tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people now, how to invest. And the reason we wanted to bring you on, Chase, because our most frequently asked question that we get literally all the time is, how do you even get started investing? Which is such a loaded question, I feel, right? And, you know, for you, right, you had someone who was kind of like helping you through that a little bit. But for other people, they feel like it's just this absolute minefield and they don't know exactly where to start. So at a high level, like what does that look like to you and what do you usually tell people or what would you do, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, they're right. You know, you shouldn't ever, I think the, the feeling I most often get is 
shame, like, oh, I should know this, or I'm just confused, or I'm behind, or everyone else knows. And that's not true. Like, no one knows. It's super confusing. The world of investing is is really full of landmines, right? You just like scrolling through TikTok, you can see like crypto bros and insurance salesmen and futures and options and day traders and 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 and, and like all these like Wall Street bros. And it's like, how could you how could you possibly dip a toe into this world without deep, deep research and knowledge and you know having a career in it and having rich parents or whatever. And so, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if that's your impression because it's not a really wrong impression. But there's some really, really good news, which is almost all of that is total nonsense. And and investing is really, really easy. It's just like a matter of like going to the right website and clicking a few buttons. Um, but you just have to know to ignore all that other noise. And and sometimes I actually listen to a podcast of myself. This sounds like very like uh, self-absorbed where someone asked me that question and I was so annoyed at myself. I'm like, just spit it out. Say how you start investing. And so I'll, like, I'll tell you how you start investing is you go to a investment website like Vanguard, Fidelity, or Schwab. These are brokerages. You click open account. Then you'll have a brokerage account, which is similar to a checking or savings account, except instead of just putting cash in a brokerage account, you put investments inside of it, things like stocks and bonds and index funds. Then you transfer money in. Then you use that money to buy your investment. And the investment I like to buy is what's called an index fund. And so that whole process takes, you know, maybe eight minutes. And then just the the hard part about investing is just picking the right investment. And and then the kind of the aha moment is there's no perfect investment. There's just a optimal investment, which is buying all the stocks, which is called an index fund. So you mentioned two things here. On one hand, you were talking about like the investment account, right? You said, go to Fidelity, go to Vanguard, open an investment account, some type of brokerage account. And then on the other hand, we have our investment products, which are the stocks, the bonds, the index funds, all of the things. I want to talk about the latter half of that first. So the actual investment product. I feel like a lot of people in one big roadblock for why a lot of people in their 20s don't start investing is because they're afraid of the stock market. And we want to spend a little bit of time hopefully talking through that like why do you think this is why do you think people are afraid of the stock market what would you say to someone if they are saying they're afraid to start investing because the stock market is volatile and all of the things yeah i mean again super reasonable and that feeling is valid um and to be fair there are really good ways to lose massive amounts of money in the stock market you know like you can you can go gamble on the stock market. There there are tools available out there to basically make these really, really speculative big bets that cause you to lose all your money. But um, that's not how I invest. That's not how I think you should invest. Um, and another reason I think it's scary is because if you just this morning or yesterday, I recorded this little TikTok that was basically like going over the financial calamities of the last five years. I started Personal Finance Club five years ago, almost the day. And we had a once in a century pandemic, a recession, um, you know, a Trump presidency, a Biden presidency. One of those people you probably think did a horrible job, um, you know, a super high inflation, a, a God or an Israel Hamas war, a Ukraine uh, Russia war, a, a, a bear market and other stuff I, I've been forgetting. And over over that period, if you're just reading these headlines, you just making a general assessment, be like, we must be in this horrible financial situation. The stock market must just be getting, getting torn to pieces. But if you just bought an index fund on the day I started, you know, five years ago, the average return was about 14.8% annualized. And historically, over the last 100 years, it's about, a, it's about 10% per year. And so even though, so that's why just kind of reading the headlines can make it feel like the stock market's a scary thing because you just hear about this bad news, you hear about these crashes, but the stock, but the news doesn't report what's always going on, which the stock market generally marches up, right? They say dog bite, dog bites man isn't news because it's always happening, but man bites dog, that's news. And so when the stock market crashes, it's like, ooh, interesting, the stock market crashed. But then the other five years in a row, it's gone up a little bit. Um, and so that's, I think that's why the nature of it's scary. But if you kind of learn how the stock market works, what's really going on is not this speculative gamble about, ooh, trying to get in and out at the right time. It's about buying all the companies of the world. If you buy Amazon and FedEx and Home Depot and ExxonMobil and Google and, and Tesla and just own them and just buy them and hold them for years and decades at a time, 
all those companies do commerce. They deliver packages and they uh, sell you goods and they sell you services and they profit. They, th those things must be true as long as society exists. They must be doing commerce. They must be profiting or they wouldn't exist. And if you own all of them, those profits are then funneled right back to you. And so the scary part of the stock market we hear isn't what I just described. It's not just the owning and holding. It's the gambling. It's the betting. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? And that's what a lot of people think about. But if you just buy and hold over long periods of time, like I said, the last five years, 15% per year, that means if you invested, whatever you invested five years ago has doubled today, right? And if it keeps, you know, five years is pretty good. Usually it doubles about every seven years though. So if you're doubling every seven years, you don't have to double many times before numbers get really, really big, which is why investing in the stock market is great. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Another question that we get super frequently is, someone saying, well, the stock market is up right now, so it's not a good time to buy, or the stock market is down right now, so it's not a good time to buy. I feel like we always get questions around like, is it a good time to buy? Um, I know you have a lot of thoughts on this, but what would you say to someone who maybe says like, well, it's up too high right now, so I'm not going to purchase, or it's low right now, so it's not a good time to buy? I mean, even the, fun the question is funny because <laughs> people are taking the exact opposite situation and and trying to apply the same solution. So I'll tell you what I do, first of all. What I do is I invest like a sociopathic robot. Whenever I have money, I put it in. I don't check. I mean, sometimes I'm aware of the market just because I like live in this world, but I don't care about it. You know, markets down, invest, markets up, invest. And so for example, if the market's down, that's actually a good thing because you can buy more shares for less. That's like saying, oh, I'm not gonna uh, go to the store right now because they're having a big sale. I'm going to wait till they're charging full price. You, you wouldn't do that, right? So if you're buying stocks, you want them to be on sale. So going down is bad. Going up, you might think, okay, then going up, the opposite must be bad. Well, if you look historically, every single year when the market is at an all-time high, or every single, actually, every single month, like if you go back the 100 years and look at every single month where the market breaks the all-time high, it's like at a, at a record high. It's never been this high, so high, it's going to fall, whatever. Then you look at the following 12 months, how did it do? the average following 12 months is up 11.2%. So just because you're at an all-time high doesn't mean you're also not at the lowest point it's ever going to be again because the market isn't this yo-yo. Uh, it's not like a yo-yo going up and down. It's like a yo-yo while you're walking up a set of stairs. And so while it might feel like you're at the top of a yo, is that what the little, the tops are, the yo's and the bombs are the yo's? I don't know what those yo's are called, but it might feel like you're top of the yo, you might also be walking upstairs. And so as the yo goes down, you're actually still going up, right? And so even if we're at an all-time high, it might also be the case what's the lowest the market will ever be again. I like to think, some people think of the market as just like a thermometer. It's like, oh, it's hot, it's cold, it's hot, it's cold. I think of it more like an odometer. It's just measuring like, you know, in your car, it measures how many miles you've gone. It just goes up and up and up because it's collecting the profits and the growth of all the companies of the world. And it's always going to go up over time until the sun expands and engulfs the earth. And then we're all... <laughs> Then we're all screwed. The yo-yo going up like stairs is such a good way to picture. Like as a visual person, that is such a good way to envision it. And I think as kind of like tying into that as like a follow-up question, one thing that we also get asked all the time is, you know, I'm only 22 or something. Why do I need to be worrying about retirement right now? And why do I need to, you know, oh, I just I want to have my first apartment. I want to do these things. Like I don't want to, why do I have to put money into a retirement account or start investing now? But I feel like it all kind of connects into what you're just saying. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of investing when you're young? Yeah. And also very reasonable. Like every question that you're saying is super reasonable. And so like I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to like wag my finger and be like, you need to be clean your bedroom, young lady or whatever. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. First of all, you know, nothing happens when you're 65 automatically. Like some people think, okay, when you're 65, you get to retire. Nothing happens. Like it's just the next day when you turn 65. So if you have $0 and you're broke, then you're going to be working when you're 66. And so when you go to a big box store and you see a 70 year old pushing carts, it's not because they have a love of pushing carts. It's because they need food and they did not save. So that's one thing. The other thing is if you are 50 and you start in saving and investing for the first time, every dollar you save after you count for inflation and the growth of the market basically will about double 
by the time, you know, in your, in your 50s, it will double by the time you're in your 60s, which is great news for 50 year olds, right? That means if you save $1,000 a month or something, you'll get, you'll have $2,000 total in 10 years. If you're in your 20s, it doesn't double, it's 16 X's. It's crazy. So every thousand bucks you save in your 20s, turns into 16,000 bucks in your 60s. And the stats, you know, what, what that's describing is basically this magical effect of compound growth. If you start early, over time, it gets to be this like snowball out of control, getting bigger and bigger. And so, you know, that's not to say you should not enjoy your 20s. You should, as someone who has lived all of his 20s, uh, you know, I wish I enjoyed them more. I think we all do. And it's, some, you know, it's hard to not live with some regrets, but like, yeah, I want you to live a full life in your 20s. But like, you know, like, let's say you're making $60,000 a year. You could live like you're making $50,000 a year or $53,000 a year or something like that, right? And you probably have friends who are making $50,000 a year. And so, and they're living their 20s, right? And so I think you need to get over this idea that like, in order to fully maximize my enjoyment in the world, I need to spend every single dollar I make because that's just not true, you know? So carve off a little bit of money, live with the rest of your money, full a full happy life today, but then live even happier knowing that you're not setting yourself up for failure down the road. Plus, by the way, nothing magical happens at 65, but it can happen much earlier. If you save, you know, 20, 30, 40% of your income, you save even more, maybe you can retire in your 30s or 40s. And as a 43 year old, 40s are still pretty young. Like you still feel like a kid when you're in your 40s. So when it comes to investing for retirement, because I would say that most of our listeners are out of college already, so they're already into their careers, they probably have access to something like a 401k or another type of employer-sponsored retirement account. So we get asked a lot, okay, well, if I already have a retirement account through my employer, do I need another one? Because the Roth IRA, you hear about it on social media all the time, right? The Roth IRA is the best retirement account, all of that. What would you say to someone that asked you that question? Do they need more than one retirement account? If you are maxing out your 401k through work and maxing out means, you know, contributing the federally mandated max, which is $23,000 for 2024, you're going to be in, in fantastic shape. So the following answer, sometimes when you're just having these conversations, it's important to like put things into perspective. Like the difference between not investing and investing is massive. The difference between which accounts you invest in is like fine tuning. You know, it's like F to A, not investing to investing, A to A plus, getting the accounts right. And so what I what I mean to say about that is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. If you're just crushing your 401k and you're sick of the sound of my voice, you know, like don't blame me, like go outside or whatever. Listen to the girls, but you know, you should still uh, you know, listen to the podcast, but not me, that's fine. Uh, but uh but that said, you know, there's, you can go from an A to A plus by which accounts you choose. And basically there's, you know, there's three main, what are called tax advantage accounts that a lot of people have access to, and not everyone does. 401k is the typical one you might have through work. Roth IRA is generally one that everyone has access to because it stands for the individual account, individual retirement account. And then there's also an HSA, which is less common, but maybe you can have one if your health insurance is a high deductible health plan which maybe a lot of young people do. And basically you can put money to all these and you can even invest it inside of all those and then maximize your growth. Um, you know, the order in which like I have an order, it's uh, 401k up to your max, HSA, Roth IRA, 401k up to the, sorry, the first one is 401k up to the match. Then the fourth one is 401k up to the max, very similar selling words. And then the last one is just a regular old brokerage account, which has an unlimited um, limit. And so if you fill those accounts up in that, that order and then buy index funds inside of all of them, you are basically optimally investing in my opinion. So you've mentioned index funds a couple of times. And I know that that's your big thing. People ask you what you invest in. And you're just like low cost index funds. And I feel like that, you know, you see it all over your profile. So can you talk a little bit more about what an index fund is and why you invest in that? specifically and why you think it is such a good investment for people to choose yes i would love to and i'm gonna i just could talk about this for hours so please you know apologize or apologies um so an index fund is basically a way to get into the stock market but you could just buy individual stocks so for example i could just go to robin hood and type in aapl which is the ticker symbol the little code for apple you know 
Apple computer, Apple company, um, and then buy a share of Apple stock for, I think it's about 200 bucks today or something like that. And then I'd be a, a shareholder of Apple, which is great. And, you know, wealthy people do this. They buy, you know, you hear about Congress, how they're always buying companies and then releasing laws that benefit or hurt them or whatever. And it's very uh, sketchy. Um, but as people who aren't in Congress like us, we are tasked with this very difficult problem of which stocks do you buy? And it's very, very tempting to think we can answer that question because we know that Apple's good. Like, I bet you, I'm not sure, but I bet you both you guys have iPhones based on your demographic. I have an iPhone. Um, you know, I coach high school beach volleyball and I have 30 girls on the team. 30 out of 30 have iPhones. We do what we did like an iMessage with my 30 team, 30 member team and like 100% iPhones. And so like, so this seems like some insight into the company of Apple. They're like, ooh, Apple must be doing great. Therefore I should buy it. But the problem is that's not, that information isn't specific to me. Everybody else knows that too. Maybe not the little volleyball thing, but they basically know that like most young Americans have iPhones uh, by like dramatic numbers. And so therefore, if I buy a share of Apple stock, I'm not getting it at some discount price by someone who doesn't know this. I'm buying it from someone else who already knows how good Apple's doing. They know that the growth trajectory, they know how much iTunes does, they know how big AirPods are, they know all this stuff. And so I have to pay them so much money for a share of Apple that if Apple does great in the future, but not incredibly great, the share price could actually go down because it didn't meet those high expectations, which makes picking stocks very difficult because you're not buying it based on what's a good company. You're basing it by buying it what's a good price relative to how good the company is. And so when you buy an individual stock, you're basically just opening yourself up to the risk of owning individual companies without kind of the benefit of diversification. And so an index fund is basically a very simple way. You can buy one thing with one ticker symbol. So for example, the ticker symbol VTI has owns all the stocks in the US. So it owns Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla, all, all of them down the list. And it owns them all in proportion to their size. So when you buy VTI, you are buying Apple, but you're also buying the, you know, 7,000 companies you've never heard of. So if one of them becomes the next Amazon or one of them becomes the next Tesla, or one of them is an underperforming company that starts overperforming, or a lot of them are great companies who continue to perform, you buy all those companies without the risk of kind of speculatively guessing which company is going forward. And they've just done massive amounts of studies on this. You know, you can, you can not trust my yap and gums, but you look at all the studies that say, how do index funds do compared to expert investors? And the answer is they almost always win, but for randomness, right? You know, they look at all the expert investors and the index fund beats 90% of them. And then they follow those 10% like, okay, those are the 10% of good investors for the next 10 years. And then the index fund beats 90% of those. And they follow like the 1% remaining for the next 10 years. And the index fund beats 90% of those. And so eventually, you know, basically if you're picking, choosing stocks, you're just eventually going to lose to the unrelenting march of the index fund that's always going up collecting the gains of every company in the market. Can you talk a little bit about how stocks come in and out of index funds? And what I mean by this is like, if I purchase an index fund today, um, 20 years from now, what is inside of that fund is not going to be the same, even though I didn't like sell that fund and buy a new share or whatever it is, um, because the stocks are like, cleansing themselves i think that's what it's called right like self-cleansing exactly um, because, <laughs> because i was reading i forget what personal finance book it was but i was reading a personal finance book one time that was talking about how like yes apple's good today but remember like the blackberries i never had a blackberry but i think my dad yeah. did um at one point blackberry was like the company and everyone had a blackberry but then if you bought a share of blackberry stock and hold it for 20 years because that's the point we're investing for retirement here that's literally decades away um you blackberry's like non-existent i don't know what parent company owned blackberry maybe like nokia or something but like if it's you called nokia, in motion <laughs> like doing too hot right now um so can you kind of talk about like that process how the stocks kind of follow in and out i mean you make a couple of good points there which is first if we go back to the year 2008 or something everyone would probably agree maybe when you go a little earlier than that but everyone would agree that blackberry is king everyone has like everyone has a blackberry back then like everyone has an iphone now and everyone knew blackberry was the best everyone knew it was going to grow and you're right now, now i i think that that stock is done terribly and so what that says it's really hard to know at any given moment like does that mean apple is going to follow the same path i have no idea maybe yes maybe no but if you go back to like 
the year 1990 or something, what is that, 30 years ago or something, and you look at the top 10 companies in the US, they were companies like IBM, ExxonMobil, Sears, uh, you know, these companies that have, you know, Sears has basically gone to business, IBM and ExxonMobil are still around doing fine, but not one of the biggest companies anymore. And so what an, what a index fund does is it basically owns the, the right proportion of every company relative to the size. So it owns the most of the biggest company, the second most of the second biggest company. And they're very big, but imagine that it only had 10 stocks. So it basically just held the 10 stock, the 10 biggest stocks. In any given moment, it had the 10 biggest stocks. But then maybe one day, the 11th biggest stock became bigger than the 10th biggest stock. Then it basically swap. It take out the tenth biggest stock and put in the new, the former eleventh biggest stock. Now the tenth biggest stock. And so you can imagine, at some point, Amazon or let's use, I think, yeah, let's use Tesla. At some point, Tesla was not one of the ten biggest stocks. Um, it was this little scrappy electric car startup. And then it suddenly entered the um, entered the top ten, kicking out IBM or something like that. And then we can appreciate the growth of Tesla too. And so it has this, exactly like you said, Aaron, this self-cleansing nature. So when you buy an index fund and just hold it for decades, you don't have to be following the market. You don't have to be understanding which companies are growth and value companies. You don't have to be understanding. It's automatically happening for you in a very organized, systematic way that has basically been studied to be proven to be optimal investing. So you mentioned a little bit earlier in what you were saying that, you know, a lot of the index funds outperform these investors. And it was a really fascinating stat that like, it's what, like 10% of the investors actually outperform the index fund. And then over the next, you know, several years, it just gets smaller and smaller as time goes, right. which is really interesting to think about. And I know Aaron and I have both gotten asked this question too. And it's something that I thought about when I started investing was like, should I see a financial advisor for this? You know, it seems like such a big thing. And you hear all these horror stories, right? Of people who get all the way to retirement or you know, they get to even 50 or 45 and they realize their money's just been sitting in their retirement account or their Roth IRA. They've never actually invested a dollar, right? So you, you're like, oh my God, I don't want to make that mistake. I want to make sure that I set this up right. What is your advice to people around that? Do you need a financial advisor? What, what are your thoughts around that? So I don't think you need a financial advisor. I think if you listen to the show and you know read a couple books, you you know, are fully capable of it. Um, I'd also like to point out that if you do go to a financial advisor and they present themselves as someone who can beat the market, someone who's going to do better than an index fund, that's not a good financial advisor. They are full of something that smells and is sometimes on your doorstep in a flaming bag. Um, uh, so that's not what a financial advisor does. But like you said, a financial advisor is still someone who just has an experienced eye who can help navigate this world and help you to figure out which index funds or tax situations or which accounts and things like that. And so my general answer is no. My general answer also is you should um, be educating yourself because if you don't, then you will have no idea if the office you walk into will be a good financial advisor or not. But that said, for the last five years, one of the hardest questions I've gotten is how do I find a good financial advisor? And I think what um, the prevailing knowledge is, is that you want to find one based on their business model, not based on their, you know, their ability to pick and choose stocks, right? So if you walk into like a, what I call a strip mall, strip mall financial advisor, um, they will sell you crappy products. They will push their, their products on you that have these crazy high fees, crazy terrible returns. They're just chasing commissions. They're trying to, you know, they're doing what strip mall financial advisors do. If you walk into like a more professional high-end financial advisor firm, they do what's called charge a percent of assets under management. You basically transfer all of your money to them. They pick and choose the funds for you, but then they charge you a percent every year. That's a better business model than a strip mall financial advisor, but there's two problems. One, they basically won't talk to you unless you have a quarter of a million dollars because charging 1% of the assets doesn't pay their bills unless there's a lot of money in there. And two, when you do the math going forward, even 1% per year over a few decades can erode you know, a third to half of the value of your fund, right? And so while you might be saying, oh, I, just, I, don't, I, I don't want to handle it, let's have someone else do it for me. If it costs you millions of dollars, you know, it's probably worth the few hours it takes to, to learn. And the crazy thing about you know paying someone to help with this is no one will ever care about your money like you do. That's the reality of it. You know, no matter how good of a financial advisor they are, 
Um, but anyway, there is a third business model, which is called advice only, where they don't um, push any products. They don't manage your assets. They just basically, you charge them, you know, they pay for an hour or a project just for the advice. Um, and that's kind of like the least conflict of interest business model that you want to search for. And I feel like everyone's been beating this advice only drum for the last few years, which is great. But the next question I always hear is, how do you find one of these advice only advisors? And the answer has always been, I have no idea. They're very busy or, you know, they're not all in the same place or whatever. Um, and so, spoiler alert, this is a little plug. Um, a year ago, my team and I basically have been, or starting a year ago, we've been building a company called Nectarine, which is a uh, marketplace for advice only financial advisors. An hour is 150 bucks. There's no products. They don't manage your money. There's no commissions. There's no strings attached. There's no recurring fees. It's just the hour. And then you can basically go, you put in your state, you choose, you know, your demographic or what you're looking for. You see the matching advisors and then you check out right there. You don't even have to, you know, you don't have to like go to the website and fill out a form and become a lead. It's just kind of like checking out at a you know normal website these days. Um, and then you can see all the reviews, all that stuff. And so it's at hello nectarine.com. Thank you. Uh, Aaron and Grace for letting me put the plug in, but it's something I really believe in, and I think that um, it will help people. So if you're if you if you are in a situation where you want someone just to put eyes on your account and make sure you haven't committed one of these um, mistakes, like keeping all your investments in cash for years, um, Nectarine is a great place to go. I love this so much. I get questions all the time asking um, if I can recommend a financial advisor to people. And I always send them the hello Nectarine link because Jeremy told us about it a couple months ago. And we've been waiting to talk about it on the podcast. We're really excited for you guys to try out Nectarine if you are looking for a financial advisor. I also really like what you said about making sure that you are sort of still taking the time to become financially literate, even if you are seeking out a financial advisor, because it's sort of like if you go to a doctor and they tell you a bunch of things related to like, let's say you get blood work done or something, and they tell you a bunch of things related to your blood work and you don't understand how to like interpret that data or you don't understand how to interpret that information and take it and like take action on it because you aren't literate in that space. So it does take a little bit of like still doing some research on the front end. Um, like you said, reading a couple books is a great way to do this. Or we always plug your courses as well. Jeremy and the Personal Finance Club team have a couple of really awesome courses that can help teach you about investing. And what, what's the other course called that you have? Uh, how to Money Like a Millionaire, just basically all the non-investing stuff like banking and budgeting and debt and estate planning and taxes and insurance, like all the stuff that like we absolutely should have learned in school it just kind of lays out how it all works what i do with my own personal accounts like very transparently um yeah i love that can you talk a little bit about like how and why you decided to create the courses and what people have been saying about them yes thank you for all these very nice softball <laughs> questions this is a great interview um uh so i you know 99 percent of what we do is still just provide educational content for free. And when I started Personal Finance Club, it was never meant to be a money-making endeavor. I still, like, I think I have enough money now, 5 million bucks in the bank. If I can live off of 4% of that, which is pretty conservative, what is that, $200,000 a year um, without working, you know, uh, I'm pretty set. That said, you know, about two years into Personal Finance Club, I was getting just like you, kind of the same questions over and over, like, what's an index fund? What's a Roth IRA? How do I start? What funds do I click? Um, you know, taxes, insurance, all this stuff. And so it was actually in 2021, no, no, sorry, it was in 2020, board during the pandemic, I basically put together this video course that kind of walks through A through Z with like live videos of me, like buying index funds, buying stocks, like showing exactly what buttons to click on. And I was just going to put out there for free. And I was like, oh, if you put it out there for free, like people don't take it seriously. No one finishes it. So I feel like maybe if I just charge a little bit, um, it, you know, people like value it more and they'll actually finish it. Um, and so I decided to charge $3,000 for the course. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's 50, it's, <laughs> I think it's $79 for the course now, but there's often sales for 59, which is actually on sale right now for 59 bucks. Um, or you can get both for 99. Um, and so, yeah, it's like kind of a hopefully modest price and, uh, you know, kind of sets you up well and so that's basically and it's actually you know we also donate 25 percent of our profits and we've donated over two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars so far which is insane um it's also enabled me to hire two full-time employees to help create more content and so that's kind of our that's our business right now is we just 
sell these two courses and create 99% of content for free and give a lot of money to charity. And uh, the, 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 you know, when you set up a, you can go review them on Trustpilot, which is like a third party site that we don't control. And the average reviews are 4.96 out of five stars um, with like 600 views. So people like the course, which is great. I was just about to say that I was like creeping on your course and looking at all the details and things about it. And I, that's one of the things that I noticed was the reviews are like, there's like, I, there was not a single one that I could find that had anything negative to say. And I think, and you also have like a money back guarantee, don't you? So I feel like that, you know, you, you clearly stand by the product. I want to take it myself just because I feel like, you know, I have my investments going, I'm investing in index funds, but I feel like you can always learn more. And I feel like a lot of people get hesitant about paying for financial products, but I mean, what is it like 79 bucks for like, then you're going to like grow a portfolio of millions of dollars, you know, like it's, it's a really small investment when you think about the potential return on your future. Um, and I also want to add one thing before we get into some of our final questions for you, you were mentioning with Nectarine and having someone have their eyes, you know, on your portfolio. And I just want to add that that's something I did and it helped me have a lot of mental peace around my investments. You know, I felt like I did it the right way. I did my research and I was like, okay, I feel like we're good here. But then the anxiety crept in and I was like, but what if I didn't? Like, what if I, what if I made a mistake, you know? And so when I was like, okay, I'm like, maybe it would just help to have someone's eyes on it. And so that's what I did. I worked with a service that is more B2B at this point. So I think Nectarine is the best option, but it really is just helpful to just pay that $150 and then leave being like, okay, whew, like I'm good. You know what I mean? Like my portfolio looks great. I have all the questions, you know, all my questions were answered. It just allows you to have a bit more mental peace if you are feeling uneasy about your portfolio. And again, it's 150 bucks to potentially that you're then going to grow a portfolio of millions of dollars. So, you know, well, potentially depending on when you're investing and how much you're investing, right? Can't guarantee a million dollar portfolio, but that's the direction we want you to be going in. But I feel like it is, it's worth it to have that piece about your, your finances. Um, so thank you. Ahead, and I, I'm gonna point out at this point that this Nectarine has not sponsored this podcast. Grace and Aaron are just very, very nice. And, um, uh, they're, they're not getting a piece of the action despite, uh, what's almost sounds like an infomercial. It's so positive, but, um, uh, thank you. That is very kind. I so, want to say very quick before you go, Aaron. Like we met Jeremy last year at a conference called Economy and Jeremy, keep in mind, like I was so new to content. Aaron and I didn't have the podcast. Like none of this was a thing, right? Jeremy is genuinely, again, this is going to sound like an, an ad and it's not, but Jeremy is genuinely one of the most genuine people like donating back the profits, like so much free content, money back guarantee on the course, like just everything that he's doing is truly with the goal of helping you build wealth. And that's why we like, we've recommended your course like so many times in <laughs> our DMS and our other podcasts, like, because we just genuinely think what you're doing is incredible and we stand behind it hundred percent. So yeah, Jeremy didn't sponsor this. Um, we're not getting paid to say nice things about Jeremy. We just genuinely like Jeremy and his products. <laughs> that's crazy. Thank you. Well, we are about out of time, but we wanted to ask you one final question before we get out of here. Um, we get this question a lot and we think you would have some good insights after doing this for 15, 20 years. Um, how do you balance saving for tomorrow versus living for today? That's a good question. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, the drum I'm often beating is like, you know, live below your means, invest, build wealth, because... I see a lot of people who are broke their whole life and it's stressful and they're worried about losing their job and they're living paycheck to paycheck and they can't retire. And I want people to be wealthy, but this pendulum can swing too far the other way. I, I sometimes see people who are trying to save like 80% of their income and, you know, won't, you know, buy an ice cream or, you know, just enjoy simple pleasures or whatever. Um, and that, you know, and so the goal of money is not to like die with the most zeros in your bank account and declare victory as you fall into your grave. The goal is, in my opinion, it's like a tool to maximize life value. And uh, as with many difficult things, I think the answer is balance, right? Um, if you are saving 0% of your income, um, you will never be able to retire. You will be very stressed. It won't be a very good in life. If you're saving 90% of your income, I would say you're probably missing some opportunities. You know, um, I'm actually not fun done with this book. I started reading this book called Die With Zero. And, you know, he makes a good point, which is, you know, 
there's always this like compound growth charts you can look at to see how much money you'll have one day. But what that doesn't really show is like the timely opportunities of things, right? Like you probably aren't going to be skydiving or hiking mountains in your 80s or whatever, right? But like in your 20s, maybe you will. And so there's times, you know, you also in your 40s, by the way, but, um, you know, there's, there's times when you, there's like an opportunity that presents itself that you shouldn't miss, right? So, and, and, and I think it's important to like understand the difference between like buying something for the short-term endorphins, right? Like when I get an Amazon box, I'm like, ooh, like a present. And then I open it and then I just throw it in the pile and I forget about it. And so it's like this little, little tiny boost of joy, but like doesn't, doesn't like add meaningful value to my life. But then when we think about our own lives and things that have meant something, it's almost always experiences, right? Like, ooh, that like trip I took in high school or the, the friends I made in college or, you know, so try in your own life to separate what just brings this little endorphin boost, this little like kind of hit of a drug that makes you feel good for a minute, but has no lasting value and probably makes you feel worse afterwards, which is just like buying stuff for the sake of buying stuff. Try to cut that out, but then jump on opportunities that will like add richness to your life, you know, experiences and friends and relationships and things like that. That's, I think, how you try to maximize your life value with money. I love that. Such a good answer. Well, we are out of time, but Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the Girls Talk Money podcast. This was such a good episode. We will be linking everything that we talked about in the show notes of this episode. So go check them out. Make sure to follow Personal Finance Club on Instagram. And until next week.